Amen. All right, here in 2 Samuel chapter number 24, we have the story of David as king committing the grievous sin when he is, he is warned about numbering the people. David goes forth and, and does so. This is spoken of in the law. He numbers the people. And there are parallel passages you can compare Scripture to Scripture. It's outside of the scope of what I focus on right now of what the sin actually is. But he numbers the people. It's a grievous sin unto the Lord. And God comes to him and gives him three options of his punishments. He gives him three options. And this is a very serious sin in which he committed. He ends up choosing the option where he's falling into the hands of the Lord. He chooses the option where God will be the one that is directly punishing him as opposed to giving him over to man, into war or something of that nature where man is the one that's going to be attacking and killing those in Israel. 70,000 end up dying by pestilence, which is like a diseases that, that uh, you know, came into the land in some way or another. In the story, though, towards the end, we see that this gets to the point of, of severity, where David needs to appease God's wrath in some way. He sees the amount of people dying. He sees, I'm sure, the sorrow, the sadness. He sees how grievous this actually is, so he's seeking some sort of appeasement from God. He wants to entreat God. So he knows the one way to do that is by sacrificing. Now, we're going to pick up reading in verse number 18. We're going to read the, the ending portion of Scripture here in uh, this particular chapter. And I want you to, I want you to you know, think in your mind while we read down through this, while we're reading this passage of how a sacrifice was David's go-to. I want you to understand the importance of the sacrifice here. Look at verse number 18. It says, And Gad came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Arunah, the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. And Arunah looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Arunah went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Arona said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servants? He's asking, Why are you coming here to me? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be saved from the people. And Arona said unto David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing instruments and other instruments of the oxen for wood. So don't misunderstand what's going on here. There's a, there's a, a small detail that can be overlooked. When you read there in, in verse number 20 and 21, when David approaches Arona, Arona sees him and he comes to him immediately. And he knows, obviously, David's the king. He's humble before David. He asks him why he's come to him. And David explains, I've come here to purchase the threshing floor of thee. The threshing floor is where they thresh wheat, of course. They prepare it, right? The chaff and all of that, they get rid of it. Now, when he comes there, he's purchasing the threshing floor and also all of the instruments that he needs for the sacrifice. Not only that, he's purchasing the sacrifices also, that which he will be giving. Now, what is a sacrifice? If you stop and think about it, what is a sacrifice? A sacrifice is something that is of value to you. It is something that has meaning to you. It is something that you need in some way or is sustaining your life in some way. Oftentimes it's a lamb, oftentimes it's food. It's always something of value, of high importance. Now let me ask you this question. Is, is it a sacrifice for you, let's say living in Old Testament Israel times, if you were to take your neighbor's lamb? The best of your neighbors. If you went and picked the best out of your neighbor's land, like this is a good one. I'm going to take this down there. Here, Lord, receive this in my hands, right? Well, does it really mean anything? It doesn't, does it? Why? Because you're not giving anything up, are you? So notice the importance is the value of the sacrifice. And notice when David approaches Arona, he explains to him from the begin very beginning that I came to purchase this of you. I came to buy this of you. Now, when Arona responds, because of his great humility, he says, take it. Take it. What does he mean? Don't give me any money for it. You can just have it. Now look at verse number 23. He says, all these things did Aruna as a king give unto the king. And Aruna said unto the king, the Lord thy God accept thee. <laughs> look at verse number 24. It says this. And the king said unto Aruna, 
Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So notice that the, the great wisdom of David. He understands that I'm not just going to take something from you of yours, something that, I, you know, that for me, I have no loss. If I take this, it wasn't mine in the beginning. I'm not losing out at all. But you know what? If I take the money that I possess, if I take the money that I've earned working as the king or what have you, all of you know, some of my rewards, and I'm willing to give that up in, in a transaction for the goods that you're going to give me and then just give that over to the Lord, well, I've, I've lost something, haven't I? So you know, Dave, what David understands here. Is that in order to sacrifice something, it has to be something that you're giving of value. It has to be something of importance to you. I want you to turn to Genesis 23. We see a very, very similar story. Now, obviously, the, the most important person <clears throat> to sacrifice to is God. Right? That is who we should be sacrificing to. Just in the general sense of the word. Sacrificing anything to is God, right? We see Abraham here understanding the same concept when he's going to bury his wife Sarah. And he goes to bury his wife Sarah. Of course, his wife Sarah means very much to him. And he goes and he's trying to find a burying place, a, a plot of land or a plot of land, right? And a very similar conversation uh, takes place with Abraham. Now, don't you look here in Genesis 23. We'll look at verse 8. Says this, and he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and entreat for me to Ephron, the son of Zoar, that he may give me the cave of Mechpelah, which he hath, which is in the end of his field. For as much money as it is worth, he shall give it me for a possession of a burying place amongst you. And Ephron dwelt among the children of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the audience of the children of Heth. Even of all that went out at the gate of his city, saying, Nay, my Lord, hear me. The field give I thee, and the cave that is therein I give it thee. In the presence of the sons of my people give I it thee. Bury thy dead. Does this seem similar? It's almost exactly the same, isn't it? Look at verse number 12. And Abraham bowed down himself before the people of the land. And he spake unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me. I will give thee money for the field. Take it of me, and I will bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying unto him, My Lord, hearken unto me, the land is worth, you know, and then he tells him, 400 shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? Bury, therefore, thy dead. Verse 16, And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron, and Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver, which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth. 400 shekels of silver, current money, with the merchant. Now, the Bible doesn't specifically tell you the reason why in which he wasn't willing to just take the cave from him. But I'll just tell you my opinion when I read this is the fact that Sarah means something to Abraham. And Sarah and he realized that, that Sarah was important to him. And he knew that if I am going to be purchasing or if I'm going to be obtaining in some way some sort of burying place or land to bury her there, it would to me, she is a value. So I would like to purchase, I would like to pay for this land where she is going to be rested. Now, like I said, so we can see different areas where people will sacrifice things. It's always where it's something of value because that is what a sacrifice is. When someone's willing to pay something, it has to be because it's something of value in the, per, in the first place. The most important area of life where we need to be sacrificing is to God. Now, in the New Testament, we don't take lambs. We don't take rams. We don't take goats. We don't take pigeons. We don't take literal blood to a literal altar, do we? No. But that doesn't mean that, that it's, we no longer sacrifice to God. I want you to turn to Romans chapter number 12. The title of the sermon uh, this evening is It Will Cost You Something. It Will Cost You Something. So in the New Testament, the temple's done, done with. The temple has been... Uh, it was destroyed by God, of course, after the, the rejection of Israel. And 
there's been a major shift in the new covenant. There's no longer a physical nation. There's no longer literal priests. There's no longer literal sacrifices. The Lord Jesus Christ is our sacrifice, isn't he? And in the New Testament, we're st- you know just because we don't have a physical sacrifice that we take, and we don't we don't you know purge blood at an altar, that doesn't mean that you don't sacrifice any longer. You actually in the New Testament. You give a greater sacrifice. You're called to give a greater sacrifice than they of the Old Testament did. And the, the, the greatest thing that you have of value is your life itself. Intrinsically, when you stop and you think about the things that you possess in your life, you know what it really comes down to on a skeleton level, on a basic rudiment level? Just one thing. You just have your life. Intrinsically, that's all you really have. That's it. You know, it's like what uh, the Satan said to to uh, when he was, when when Satan was speaking to God, right, and, uh, about Job, and he said, "Scan for scan, all the man hath will he give for his life." You know why? Because that's really all you really have. It's really the only thing that you really have. It's not only really the only thing intrinsically that you have, because you can lose all that other stuff, right? But it's the only thing really of great value that you have that you're given. You can lose everything, but you'll always still attain your life you know, until your life ends on this earth. You know, the life that you have on this earth is something that you are guaranteed, obviously, for a period of time. <laughs> for, that way, for a period of time. But it is, the, uh, it is the greatest thing of value to you. Any man, when he, you know, you, if you look at all the, the, the most wealthy men in this world, it doesn't matter who you name, you know, the, 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 the Gates, Trump, whoever it may be, you look at all of these different people. When they get old and they get to the point of death, you know what they start doing? They start taking all the money that they have and just throwing it to doctors. All the money that they have, they just start taking it and throwing it to science and all of these different things. You know why? Because they'll do anything to save their life at this point. They realize it's coming to the end and I have nothing left. I have nothing at this point. If that truly is, you know, uh, uh, insincerity, that is the truth. That really the only thing of value and the greatest thing of value that you have is your life. I want you to look at Romans chapter number 12, verse number 1. Romans chapter number 12, verse number 1, the Bible reads, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. So the great mercy that God bestowed upon us for salvation. He's saying, I beg you, that's what beseech you means. That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That may seem almost like an oxymoron, but it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, it says that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. You think of a sacrifice all throughout the Bible, what is it? It's death is what it is. That's what a true sacrifice is. It's death. But he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies, he says, a living sacrifice. What God wants from you as a Christian, what God wants from you in the New Testament, what God wants from everyone in here is for you to sacrifice your life. And when you when you really look, look at your life, when you really look at the amount of time that you have on this earth, it's very little. Now, I want everyone to, to uh, if you have a cell phone, I want everyone to participate. Pull out your cell phone, or if you're good with multiplication, I want you to pull out a piece of paper and a pen, either or. The average human life, when it's broken down into days, breaks down to 27,375 days. Does that sound like a lot to anybody in here? It's not very much at all. 27,375 days. Now, I want you to do something quickly because I went ahead and did this myself. So, of that 27,375 days, I, Tyler Baker, personally for my, for my life, I've already used 10,585 of my days. Let that set in for a minute. That's crazy. Now, I want you to take the number 365 and times it by the amount of years that you've lived thus far. So the average human life is 27,375 days. You see that number? Now I want you to take that number and I want you to minus 
subtract from 27,375 days. On average, that's what you have left that you're looking at right now. That's the average amount of time that you have left on this earth. Now, I'm not saying that to discourage anyone. I'm not saying that to scare anyone. You know what that should do to you? You know what that did? When I, when I put that calculation into, into the, the calculator, I thought, man, I don't have that much time left. You know what that should do is that should motivate you. Amen. You know, I started thinking about all the things that I've spent my life on. And one of the things that always comes up that I, I've basically wasted my entire life is basketball. And just what vanity and what, how I, you know, just what time is spent on things like that. And also a connecting thought that I had after that was all the people that pursue a lifestyle of maybe playing professional sports, in order to succeed in that area of life, do you know what they have to do? They have to choose where they're going to sacrifice that time, don't they? So to a person that maybe that's what their ultimate goal is, well, that's what they would be left with doing, isn't it? That their ultimate goal is, I one day want to be a professional athlete. But do you know what you have to do to do that? You have to take what's most valuable to you. Skin for skin, all that a man has to give for his life. What is the most valuable thing? And you have to allot all of that time and all of those days under the category of whatever you want the most. You have all the different areas in your life. You have to choose where you're going to be putting those days. You add up the time. You know, obviously, a lot of it you know, is, is uh, eliminated through sleep, right? Of course, these are full days, but just if we break it down to minutes and things, a lot of your time is eliminated through sleep. And, uh, but if you, I want you to do this. What if, and, and maybe you haven't been saved very long, maybe you haven't been serving God very long, but I want you to think in your mind. All the time that you've spent in your life reading your Bible. If you were to accumulate the amount of minutes, and we could, you know, add those minutes up and put it into days, Crew it into days. How many days have you spent sitting down reading your Bible? If you could take all the minutes of your life where you've went soul winning and you could compile all those minutes together and put them, and we had a chart, and we could put all the minutes of your life, whoever it may be, Russell Bobs, Esther Bobs, Anthony Bobs, anyone here in our church, and we had a category, a chart here with different categories of where the time in your life was spent. And we said, hey, these are the amount of minutes that I've spent reading my Bible. These are the amount of minutes that I've spent soul winning. These are the amount of minutes that I've spent singing hymns and praising God. These are the amount of minutes that I've spent at church. These are the amount of minutes that I've spent praying. Where would your time fall? Or would you have this other category over here of personal interest and hobby where most of your minutes went? Would you have this other area of life way over here that's totally outside of, totally unrelated to God, where that's where most of your time falls? That's where most of your time was allotted throughout your life. You know, God requests from you that which is the most valuable thing that you have. Really the only thing intrinsically that you even have. And you know what it is? It's your time in your life. And when you break down the numbers, time flies, man. And you sit there and you look at the, how much time you actually have left, it's not that much. And I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to motivate you. I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to warn you that you're not going to be on this earth for as long as you think you are. Everybody thinks I have all the time in the day. And you hear people make statements all the time of, you know, I'll do that later. Or, These are my plans in the future. Or, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this when I get a little bit older. Or maybe when I grow up, I'll do this. You don't have that much time. And when you start deciding, you know, where you're going to... What, what categories are you going to put your time in? Before you know it, it's all gone. Your, your time is going to be distributed in one of, one of you know, few areas. It's either personal interest. Of course, we have to work for a living. But you, you, you get rid of the time. You dispense the time for work. All the necessities. Eating. Things like that. Spending time with family. Do you know what you have left? Like I, like I mentioned, you have personal interests, personal hobbies. I'm not telling you never to pursue things like that at all. Not that pursue is the wrong word. I'm not telling you to never uh, put any time into that at all. But how, how, 
If we, were to, if we were able to look at your life and where the minutes were deposited, would it be lopsided? Yes. Would it be way over here in the personal interest and, and just, you know, vanity? Just spending time, you know, watching sports, spending time doing this, spending time doing that, spending time just wasted. Those are days, those are minutes that when you're at the end of your life, you're never getting back. All the time that's gone now, you don't get it back. You get none of it back. You know, that which God asks from you is that which is the most valuable thing you have. It's really the only thing you have. And it's your life. He requests a living sacrifice. This is not just related to the New Testament. This is in the Old Testament as well. I want you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter number 1, verse number 9. 1 Samuel chapter number 1, verse number 9. John chapter number 15, verse number 13. I'm going to read to you. I, I meant to paste it here. I don't have it. But John chapter number 15, verse number 13. Very well known verse we're all familiar with. It says this. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The greatest thing that Jesus had was his life, wasn't it? I mean, the, the, that, that while he was on earth, the mo of most importance to him was his life, wasn't it? That's why it's, it's expressing a great love because he was willing to sacrifice something great because it was of great value. It was the only life he had, right? And he was willing to give that one life that he had for the world. So that's why it says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. God's not asking you, you know, to, you know, to, to strap yourself to an altar, right, and literally sacrifice yourself and die like Jesus died. That would do you no good. You know, you have your own sins to pay for, right? That wouldn't do us any good. What God wants you to do is he wants you to spend the rest of your life as a living sacrifice, to dedicate all the time and all the days that you do have left serving him and not serving you when you look when you when you really break it down what all the time that you're not spending serving god who are you spending it on you're spending it on yourself that's what it comes down to my friend whether that bothers you or not but that's what you're doing you're spending it on yourself is what you're doing go to first samuel chapter number one like i said it's the story of uh, hannah first samuel chapter number one so even in the Old Testament, God wanted people to, to be willing to just dedicate their entire lives. Give that which is the most value, the most important to them. The highest price, like David said. He knew that it wasn't of any worth unless he paid a lot for it. So you need something of value. And that which you possess of the most value is your life. So even in the Old Testament, people would give and dedicate just their whole lives. Their whole lives serving God. We see this with Hannah. 1 Samuel chapter number 1 verse number 9 it says this. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord and she was in bitterness of soul. It's because of course she's, she's barren. She's unable to have children. And prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said O Lord of hosts if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord, look at this, all the days of his life. And there shall no razor come upon his head. And we'll keep reading, verse 12. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved. But her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. Let's get down to verse number 16. Count not that thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. So this actually is... The Nazarite vow. A lot of people may read over this and not understand it, but Samuel was a Nazarite, just like Samson was a Nazarite. Samuel actually here, this vow that is made, she promises for a, a razor not to come upon his head all the days of his life, 
and he's going to be given all the days of his life unto the Lord. Well, that means that he's consecrated. That means that he's sanctified. This is only found in one other place, and it's, it's Numbers chapter number 6, which is the Nazarite. The Nazarite vow, that particular vow, as we just read, is a vow where a parent would make for their child, which is something of a great value, right? For a, a, a parent to sacrifice their child, it's of great value. A parent to sacrifice their child means, you know, me, it, the child means a lot to them. And they would give that child unto the Lord, as she says, all the days of his life. A Nazarite would go and they would serve God with their life continually. I want you to look at that statement with me. Verse number 11. It says this. We'll begin with man. The very, very end of the, the verse. It says this. Then I will give him unto the Lord. Who knows what it says? All the days of his life. Isn't that powerful? You know what Samuel spent his life doing? All the days of his life. I mean, think about that. 27,375 days. When you get to the end of your life, what do you think you're going to wish you spent your days on? Serving God. Because Hannah, of course, was willing to, 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 to vow this vow and to, to give up her son. Samuel, which ended up becoming a great man of God, didn't he? One of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, one of the greatest men of God. He had his faults, but you know what he said at the end of his life, I'm sure at least? He said, I spent my life serving God. I spent my life, all the days of my life were given to the Lord. If you looked at the chart of Samuel's life, according to this, at least Hannah's plans for him 27,000, if he lived the average life, 27,375 days were spent serving God. Now, a lot of people don't have that opportunity, sadly. Maybe some don't have the gospel given to them until maybe they're 45, maybe they're 50. Everybody may not have this opportunity. But the Bible talks about, you know, unto whom much is given, of him shall much be required. God understands that God judges on a curve. And God understands if you hadn't heard the gospel until a later time in your life, but do you know what you should do? You shouldn't use that to make excuses for the rest of your life. You should take the days that you do have from this point on, and you should put them in the category of serving God all the days of your life. Amen. Wouldn't it at least be good to say, once I got saved, once I did receive the gospel, and I put my faith in Christ, and I was a believer, that every day that I live from that day forward, all the days of my life was under the Lord. Wouldn't that be good at least? Maybe you got saved at 20, maybe you got saved at 25, maybe later, maybe earlier. You know what? Everybody ends up wasting time somewhere, don't they? Some we're all we're, we're flesh. We're, we're human beings, right? You know what you should really try to do at, at the very least? Is eliminate the amount of minutes. Is the eliminate the amount of hours. Eliminate the amount of time in your life that's not dedicated. You know, people nowadays, you know, they don't understand the concept. They don't understand the idea that you can't have something if you're not willing to give something for it. People don't, they, they, they think, people really are under the impression, you know, the, the entitlement type of attitude that people should just give them things and they should just have things of great value. But no one that ever did anything good, no one that ever did anything secularly or, or what it had, anything, it doesn't matter what area we speak about. If you speak about a professional athlete, they don't get there by just waking up and one day having great skills and great athleticism in all these areas. Yeah, they may be born with some talents, but there's still a lot of work involved. If you look at people that want to start companies, you know, if you talk to any person that starts from the bottom and works his way up, they'll tell you I invested day after day, night after night. Why? Because I wanted something of worth. If you want to get to the end of your life and have a life that has value in God's eyes, you better take something valuable and deposit that time in that category. You better take something that's worth something. You're not just going to spend this little amount of time and then get to the judgment seat or get to the end of your life and look back and have a valuable life in the, in the eyes of God. God loves you, of course, but you know what? This is the truth. There are people that are more pleasing to God and there are people that are less pleasing to God. You know, uh, John, the disciple John was, was the disciple whom Jesus loved. 
What does that mean? He stood out amongst the disciples. That's obviously a specific title that was given to John that was not given to the other men. You know? It's funny people will joke about, well, John gave himself that title when he wrote the book of John. But that's obviously not true. The Holy Spirit wrote the book of John. But there was obviously a way in which John stood out in the eyes of the Lord. People stand out in the eyes of God. God will give you the rundown of people's lives and you read about the kings in the Old Testament and God will say, this person did that which was right in my eyes, this person didn't. God looks at your life at the end and based upon the time and the sacrifice that you make for him, that determines the amount of value that your life has. You know why? David knew that this sacrifice that I'm about to offer the more that I spend, the more money that I, that I actually invest in this is really the more that I'm sacrificing myself. The more money that I put into this, the more value that this sacrifice is going to have. That which we have, which is the most valuable thing to us, is our life. That's why God asks you to be a living sacrifice. He wants you to take the most valuable thing that you have. The most important thing that you have, really the only thing that you have in your life. And he wants you to dedicate all the days of your life to serving the Lord. Wouldn't it God we could get at a point in our lives where we could say, when years went by, you could say after six years, the past six years, all the days of those six years I spent serving God. The past 12 years, the last 20 years of my life, I'm now 80 years old, an old man, I can look back and at least say, hey, 50 years of my life, 60 years of my life I spent serving God. Don't get depressed about the time that you've lost. You can't do anything about that. That's a waste of time. When people sit there and, and worry about something that's gone and it's in the past, it's, you're, now you're just wasting more time. You know what you just did? A few more minutes went by that you wasted now. You know what you need to do is you just need to press forward like the Bible talks about. You need to look forward and you need to start investing all of your time that you do have now. All that time that's gone, you know, I've already used, like I said, 10,585 days of the 27,375 days. I have 16,000 something left. The amount of time that's gone, I can't do anything about that. But you know what I can do something about? I should have added the rest of the number up, but the 16,000 and so odd numbers. I can do something about that. I can choose where I put that time, can't I? I can choose where, because here's the thing. You're sacrificing your time on something no matter what. And it's still a sacrifice because your life's important. Your life is valuable. So when you choose to put your time and invest it into something else, it's still a sacrifice. It's just a sacrifice for yourself. It's just a sacrifice for something else. Why not make it a sacrifice for the Lord? Why not, why not put all of your time for the Lord? Go to Numbers chapter number 3, verse number 11. Here's another example of this in the Old Testament where God asked for someone to dedicate their entire life from beginning to end to serving him. Of course, you're familiar with the story of the Passover. God slew the firstborn. This started. The, that's where that comes from, the Passover, where God passed over them, the death angel. And he slew all the firstborn. Well, going forward, they would offer the firstborn sacrifice, wouldn't they? And instead of the firstborn of the children of Israel within each family. God, of course, didn't want them to lay down their personal lives, right? God had, there was only one sacrifice humanly that would suffice that, and that was God himself. So God doesn't want them to lay down their personal lives. The only he wants them to do is he wants them to be a living sacrifice. So instead of taking the firstborn and actually killing the firstborn of each family, he took the entire tribe of Levi, every single person. And you know what? their whole entire life was serving God all the days of their life. Just like he said, as Hannah said about her son Samuel, that she was going to give him to the Lord all the days of their life. Look at Numbers chapter number 3, verse number 11. Numbers chapter number 3, verse number 11. It says this, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, And I, behold, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel, instead of all the firstborn that openeth the matrix, the matrix it's talking about the womb, among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine, because all the firstborn are mine. For on the day that I smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I hallowed, that's like sanctified or 
set apart, <coughs> consecrated is what I was trying to think of. I hallowed unto me all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. Mine shall they be. I am the Lord. Now when he says mine shall they be, what did they do? Just continually, literally, their job, day and night, was to work in the temple. Was to work at this time in the tabernacle, just serving God all day. Why? That which was what 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 greater sacrifice could they have given than their life? You have nothing more to offer, really, truly. You have nothing more to offer. It is God. Here, this is what makes it a value as well. It's the most important thing in this sense as well to you, because that's what makes it a sacrifice when you're losing something. You understand what I'm saying? That's what causes it to be a value because it means something to you as well. Because then once you're sacrificing it, well, you're at a loss, right? And that is, and whether you realize it or not, your life, and some people may not think that their life is a value, but it's, it's the only thing that you possess. Even if you don't realize what, what, what value your life has, it is that which you have the most, in your life that you have that value, that is the most valuable. Go to Matthew chapter number 25, verse number 14. Anything of value has to have a sacrifice. You think of salvation. How sweet is salvation? Well, salvation was free, right? Yeah, for you. But it had a great cost, didn't it? Salvation was free for you. But it wasn't free for Jesus. It wasn't free for God's son, was it? No, he had to give something valuable. Your salvation means a lot to you? Well, guess what? It wasn't. It wasn't. It was free to you. But it wasn't, it wasn't just worthless. There was a lot that had to be given, wasn't there? Jesus had to die for you. When you read about the agony and the suffering and everything that Christ went through in order to offer you that salvation, you know what that helps you understand? Yep. Obviously, you should be at least happy and, and, and grateful anyways, but it should make you more grateful. Because you know what it tells you? Man, that is important. My salvation is obviously valuable to be willing to pay something. That much for it. We're going to end here in Matthew chapter number 25. If you look up etymology, that is you know, the, the study of words and where words come from. Our word talent, because a lot of people learned how to read from the Bible. You know, a lot of words developed from their context in the Bible, in the English language. So etymology is the way in which a word evolves or changes throughout time. Well, the word talent that we have today uh, it refers to a skill that someone has, and it, it refers to a, a, a skill that someone has inherently that they're born with oftentimes, right? Uh, whether you're aware of that or not, but that's what it is. That, that's what our word talent is. That word talent actually derived and, and changed in meaning from the passage of Matthew chapter number 25 when you look at the English language. You can look this up and verify this yourself if you'd like. But it didn't used to mean that. The word talent used to actually mean a type of money or currency. When you read the word talent in the Bible, it's referring to a currency that they had. Keep that in mind when you look here at Matthew chapter number 25, verse number 14. I'm going to read a story here. Verse number 14 says this. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. <coughs> And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability. And straightway took his journey. So notice it says there in the beginning that he gave talents, the money. And what does it say then after that? That he gave them these talents based upon the abilities that they had in their life. And this is, like I said, where the word talent actually you know, uh, evolved from. Our word talent today. Verse 16, then he, ha then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying... Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. 
Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not straw. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. What's he saying? He's saying he's lazy. Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not straw. Thou oughtest, therefore, to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming <clears throat> I should have received mine own with usury. Take, therefore, the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto everyone that hath shall be given and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And then he goes on, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this passage, of course, it's a parable. And the parable is actually representative of Israel and the Gentiles. And I believe I've preached on this one other time. It's not just about all of Christianity, all of Christians, those that are saved, and the people losing their salvation. Or like some, you know, uh, heretics will teach that, that, that certain people that, you know, are saints won't go to the lake of fire for a period of time. You know, that's heresy, obviously. That's not what this is teaching. This passage is about people that you know, were of the nation of Israel and were given opportunities, right? They were given, they had everything given unto them, and what did they do? They just threw it away. But then you have the Gentiles who had basically nothing. And they were given everything. Everything was shifted and given over to them. That's what happened. You know, and that's what this story is about. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. That's what the, all of the parables, every last one of them, is over and over again talking about the, how the kingdom is being taken. If you just read this chapter after this, go to chapter 24, chapter 26, every parable is about, and it's clear, it's about Israel, everything being taken from them. But of course, there are secondary applications you can learn from. And if you look at this, and notice that the talents were given, and they were representative of abilities that different people had, right? If someone had these few great abilities, what would he do? He would give them, with those abilities, he would give them these talents. And this is, like I said, where the talent, our words talents came from today. You know what they did? They chose where they were going to spend their talents, or they chose where they were going to spend their abilities. They chose where they were going to spend or invest their life, didn't they? And you have, I don't know how many days, you know, you looked at that calculator, not me. You know how many days that you have left going forward from right now. That's on average. You may have a lot less. You may have more. I don't know. But that's how many days that you have left. And you know what? You're going to choose where you put those talents. You're going to choose where you put those abilities. You're going to choose where you invest that time. You're going to sacrifice it somewhere because it's got to go somewhere. At the end of your life, there's a black and white list that I can break down. And I can say, if I was able to you know, see all of your life, you could see where the time was invested. There's time that will be spent serving God. I'm sure there'll be, there will be some time spent on yourself, won't there? But you know what? What to God that you could at least say that days were spent on the Lord? What a God, you can at least look at the end of your life. And yeah, maybe you spend a little bit of time here one day, a little bit of time here another day. But by and large, each individual day was put into the category of serving God. That you would have days where you were soul winning. That you would have days where you were reading your Bible. That you will have days where you were going to church. You're going to run out of time one day going soul winning. There's going to be a point in your life when you can never go soul winning again. There's going to be a point in your life when you can never read your Bible again. There's going to be a point in your life, there's going to be a point in the history of everyone here. Elliot Ray will, will have a point in time and in history when he can no longer attend church. He'll have a point in time and in history when he can no longer open up a Bible and read it. Because his life will be over. Yeah, he may be able to do that in heaven. He'll have the Word of God there with him, right? Amen. But you know what? 
far as his life and what he was given and the opportunities that he had, and all of the days of his life, they're gone. And they can never, you know, that, that first number that you saw, all that time's gone. You can never change that. But you have a lot of days ahead of you. The majority of people in here at least have most of, at least more than half of their life left, right? Well, you know what you can do? You can at least say that the majority of my life I spent and invested that time and sacrificed that time in this area. Where? Serving the Lord. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for your great example of, of your son.